Welcome to Westside this morning. Those that are joining us live, thank you for being here with us via the internet or social media or whatever the case may be. It is good to be home. We was here and preached last week and was uh, in for like a couple of days and then uh, right back out again. Um, and so it's really, it honestly is. We had a great time on vacation this past week. Uh, I want to just give you a little something to add to your prayer list. This past week, we were um, uh, in Colorado Springs at a pastor's gathering, uh, just a small church, mid-sized church pastor's gathering. Uh, not a lot of pastors. It was kind of a round table thing. And kind of want to just take a moment just to explain to you, how many of y'all know God is doing some really neat things in the world that we're living in today? And so some really good things that's going on. And so one of the things that we've been seeing going on right here uh, locally um, and through this whole pandemic thing and all that, the churches and the pastors and the hearts coming together and God pulling this thing together and of one mind and of one accord and being able to move forward in those things. And so what God has been doing at a local level after we were out there, uh, literally we had pastors from Washington, South Dakota, Detroit, Michigan, and Long Island. What a crew for this guy to be around, right? <laughs> you ever seen a hillbilly and a Long Islander get together? It was a, it was, for, the, the, for everybody else that got to watch, it was a good time, I'm sure, on that one right there. You know, they got that, that, that they talk funny there. They thought we talked funny, but they are like from another, I don't know, do you, so one of the questions was, uh, do you have any salsa? And so I thought they were talking about salsa. And I thought, well, I, there's probably salsa around here somewhere. I don't know. We're in Colorado. They might. It wasn't salsa. They were looking for seltzer, which is water. Who knew, right? Who knew? Right, right. So seltzer. That's not even the same language. But, of course, they thought that we talked a foreign language. Anyway, just having some fun with that. There was, uh, there was about a... No. I don't know how loud that speaker was out there, but it was loud right there. I can tell you that. All right. Apologies. We want to make sure that we take care of our online congregation, too. Um, all of that to say this, there's a group of pastors uh, across the northern tier, us representing the, the center of the country, and across the southern tier from uh, Orange County, California, all the way over to uh, South Carolina, Alabama, all that whole bit uh, right there. And what we, what we determined, it's a, it's a gathering of, of small church pastors and we sense that God is bringing unity among his people, um, not just at the local level, but in a regional and in a national level, to be able to uh, do some amazing things in these, these last days. How many of y'all know there's a time like has never been that is in, at least for sure, in our nation, and I think globally as well, that we need to see the power of God and the fruit of God on display like we've never seen before. And so anyway, um, we didn't necessarily get a whole lot uh, as far as uh, established other than just making connection and getting headed. It was a great start. And so um, the way that this worked, Carl Vaders that was here, uh, Carl Vaders is a, is, a, is a small church pastor from a great big uh, area in uh, Southern California, Orange County. And, and um, even, how many of y'all know there are a lot of small churches even inside big cities, right? And, and so we're not just isolated just because we're rural. Not all small churches are small just because they're rural. And so what we found is that there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of differences, but there's a lot of similarities as well. And Compassion International, which is a huge organization, some of you may be familiar with, maybe even sponsor, anybody here sponsor a child from Compassion International? All right, so turns out, I didn't know that that was the only thing they did. I thought that it was, but turns out that not. They are very involved with the local church. And what they're wanting to do is to strengthen the small, 95% of the churches in America are small to mid-size. Only 5% are the mega-sized mega churches. And so, and, and the number that they use is like about four or 500 and under uh, down to, you know, the local, maybe a, maybe a congregation of 15, 20, or 30. Um, with all the things that's going on, they want to come around and help strengthen and, and, and serve uh, the, the, the smaller churches and, 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 and those congregations and their pastors. 
And to do that, they needed to be able to make uh, more connections into that particular realm. So they brought all these pastors in uh, from different areas, different regions of the nation, brought us together, put us around a round table, and they sat in there with us and they started saying, listen, what do we need? What can we help you with? What all those things right there? Because we have a heart for the mission. Everybody say the mission. That's what they have a heart for. And so I was really encouraged by that. Carl Vaders, who was here about three or four years ago at one of our pastor's conferences that we hosted here, um, spoke. And he is a small church pastor that God has used now to step out of the pulpit. And he literally travels all over the nation encouraging and strengthening and serving small churches and pastors and, and, and helping them to do small church better. And so that was why we had him here to encourage some of the local pastors and some things like that. And so he has a connection with compassion. And so God's doing something. We don't even know exactly what all that is right now, but God's doing something. So I ask you to be in prayer about that. We met literally pastors from across the nation and who have a heart, just like our heart, to love God and to be fruitful. Everybody say fruitful. Now here's the other neat part of this whole thing. So you guys know that for the last few weeks I've been sharing out of the parable of the sower, right? And the sower, he went forth to sow seed. Everybody say, good seed. In this sower, in sowing this good seed, we go through these different types of soil, right? The first type of soil was the hard soil. It had never been plowed. It was hard, and the seed just fell on it and just sat there on the top, and the fowls of the air came, and they stole it away, right? That's the parable of the sower. This is Matthew chapter 13. And in that parable of the sower, he said, those are the ones that, that, that maybe hear the word of God, but they don't understand it. They never follow up on that. And then the next type of soil was the soil that was stony. Everybody say stony ground, right? And that's, how many of y'all have had some hard places in your own life and in your own walk with God? Anybody ever dealt with brokenness, unforgiveness, right? Anybody ever dealt with some pain or anything? Sure you have. And so we, and, 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 and sometimes... <laughs> Those stony things. He talks about offenses. Everybody, anybody here ever gone to church and got offended with someone, right? I don't need to see your hands, right? You may get offended with me before it's over with. All right, so those offenses are designed by hell to prevent you from receiving what God has for you in the very best and to prevent you from being fruitful of which God has called us all to. We're going to look at that, and that's the, that's the context. We're at that fourth stage, which is the good soil, good seed in due season produces a great crop. Amen. That's that fourth type of soil. The third type of soil was the good seed into the good soil. The seed germinates. It begins to bring forth fruit. This is what we talked about last week, but... It became, everybody say, it became. It became unfruitful because the, the thorns, the thistles, the weeds choked it out. And so um, I, here's the kind of gardener that I am. Um, I could go down, for those that are good gardeners, we could go down, and uh, Don Sigmund was here in early service, and, and, and Don uh, manages MFA down here, and, and I said, I, we could go down to MFA, we could buy the same bag of potting soil, we could take seed out of the same package, and I have the ability to get about a tenfold return, good soil, good seed, bad gardener. Some of you are good gardeners. You can take that same soil, you can take that same seed, and it's incredible what you can do with that. Everybody say fruitful. Amen. All right. Easy question. How many of y'all want to live a fruitful, productive life? Been given potential, right? So we, we teach this all the time. Your potential, that's God's gift to you. Your potential. What you do with that potential is your gift back to God. What are you doing with your potential? In the, in the fourth type of soil, we read it just in a moment, just kind of laying out a foundation of where we're going to about this fruitful thing. He talks about that soil that brings forth. It's, it's good soil. They hear the word. They understand the word. But I've always had a question about this. If it's good seed and it's good soil, how come there's only a 30% return sometimes? Right? 30, 60, 100-fold return. How many of y'all have read that, right? We read it just... Why, if it's good seed in good soil, does it only yield 30%? Or sometimes 60%? Or any number... Or what, is it, what does it look like? How, that 100-fold that return, I want to live a fruitful life. I want to engage and connect with and embrace the things that God has for me. 
And, and I want that to be... At the end of my days, Pastor Scott was talking about the 23rd Psalm and him preparing a, a, a table before us in the presence of our enemies. How many are glad for that, huh? Mashed potatoes and gravy on the table while the enemy's over there gnashing his teeth. It's like, ah, God will take care of you. I'm going to eat, right? And, and so... Here's the, way that, here's the way that psalm ends. He says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. How many of y'all look behind and see that behind you? Good fruit, right? Good fruit following. And then he says, so he's looking back and he's saying, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Woo! Sounds good, doesn't it? Right? Good, good stuff. And so... What is the fruitfulness of your life? So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and, and, and so I love this conference because the timing was just so relevant to where we're at literally in this study. We've gone through those first three types of soil, the message, and, 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 and I had no idea exactly where they were going to be coming from out there. I went because Carl and Shelley invited us to come, not knowing exactly what all compassion had in mind. Again, my mindset was they take care of kids. So I'm waiting on the sales pitch. I told Marsh, I said, you know there's going to be a sales pitch, right? They're going to sell us and they want to come and they want to write because they're, they're, it didn't happen. That wasn't what it was. They said, we want to come and help. How can we help you be more fruitful? How can, we, how can we serve? And I thought, wow, that's why they're a big organization because they still have a heart for the things of God and to serve. And they haven't forgotten um, the, uh, the small or the, or the mid-sized church. Genesis chapter 1, 26 uh, where does your theology start? Carl, uh, again, out there, I'm going to share a few of the things as we go through this because there's some really good nuggets uh, that are relevant to where we're at in this particular study about troubling the darkness. Everybody look over at your name and tell them you look like a troublemaker to me. Huh? We're still troubling the darkness. Let me, let me tell you, where, let me tell you where, the, where, where, where the baseline of this message is today. I think one of the most troubling things to hell itself is when you bear fruit in tough times. When you say the time, it's rough, it's hard, it's tough, but God's just doing a work in your life and you're still just pumping it out, right? You got fruit growing, right? And, and, and God's doing an amazing thing and hell's doing all it can to stop you and you just keep bearing fruit. Good seed in good soil and living fruitful. All right. Okay, so that's where we're going in this thing. It's troubling to the darkness. And our philosophy is this right here. I believe it's the truth of the Word of God. We shouldn't be troubled by darkness. We ought to be troubling the darkness. Amen? You're the light. Hell has no solution to you. It, it, it don't know what to do with you. What's hell going to do with the cross? All paid for. Can't charge you again if you won't let them. You, if you want a scoop, it's like what Pastor was talking about. Get you a scoop. It's there. It's paid for. There's a big old table spread for you. If you go away hungry, if you go to family camp when we're all getting together in Colorado, if you go away hungry, it's your own fault, just like he said. And I think the table of God is the same way. In Genesis 1.26, we see where God said, Let us make man in our image. Good theology, this is what uh, Carl, I, I'm going to adopt this and so I give him credit for this. I agree completely and we've always taught this. Good theology doesn't start in Genesis 3 with the fall of man or the flaws of man or the faults of man. How many of all know we have flaws? We all have faults, right? We've got those things. Aren't you glad that God loves people who fail because there is no other kind? Anybody say Amen. Got dense, got huh, all those kinds of things, but God loves us anyway. Now, some people's theology starts in Genesis 3, and it all begins with the fall of man, and, and, and it's a wrong perspective in the context of if God's going to restore us, He has to restore us back to something, and this is the, this is the work of Jesus Christ. This is the work of salvation to bring us back into a place where the image of God, right? Jesus, our example, said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the image of God. And so the work of Christ on the cross is to give us an avenue by which we could come back to the image of God. Born again. New chance. Slate white clean. You get a new start. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with that? God's called us to be fruitful. He goes on. Now, let's, let's read this and let me get it in context right here. Uh, Genesis. Let me get in there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. 
God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth, every creeping thing. Look over at your name and tell him you have power over creeps. All right. It's all good. Over everything that creeps, it said everything, right? Every creeping thing, you got power over all the creeps, so don't let the creeps determine your fruitfulness. So God created. He didn't just talk about it, He did it. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created him male and female, created he them, and God blessed them. How many of y'all like being blessed? Huh? I'd rather live blessed. I'd rather be blessed than good. I'd rather be blessed than smart. I'd rather be blessed than wealthy. I'd rather be blessed than lucky. I like being blessed. Anybody say amen? I like blessed. It's a great place to live. Somebody needs to do it. So that's why we make gravy by the gallon. Fruitfulness. Gravy by the gallon. I like tomatoes. Jim Owens grows tomatoes that look like red cantaloupe. About five or six slices off of one of them covered with gravy and you've got a meal. You take dominion over a fish or over some beef and you've got a real meal. Amen. All right, for you vegetarians, Everybody know what vegetarian is, right? It's an old Indian word for bad hunter. That's exactly what it is. And so, okay. All right. God bless them. <laughs> and God said, everybody say, God said. God said. See, that's where we come into the parable of the sower. God said. Here's what God spoke over you thousands of years ago. Look over at your neighbor and tell them, be fruitful. Huh? Be fruitful. God said to them, you be fruitful. See, when we study this, as we go through this today, from the beginning, chapter 1, all the way throughout the New Testament, the plan of God has never changed. God has called you. God said unto us, be fruitful. Multiply and replenish. Everybody say replenish. <laughs> replenish is the plan of God to do it again. And do it again. How many of y'all know he gave us seasons? And in those seasons, there's a cycle by which we do it again. You plant the garden this year in the spring. You tend the garden during the summer. You harvest the garden during the fall. And you let everything set and rest during the winter. And then you start it all over again. Everybody say replenish. It's the plan of God for our life and being fruitful. Okay. In that context, he goes on and he says this too, though. It tells us that there's some things that we have to overcome. Everybody say overcomer. How I many all know the scripture says that you're more than overcomers. You're more than conquerors. That's what the word of God says about you. If he hadn't intended us to overcome some things, he wouldn't have written at the very beginning, subdue. How I many all know what subdue means? All right, some of you have never been arrested. <laughs> I have personal experience with that. I'm not going to say how. But if you've ever been subdued by somebody with a higher authority, someone who has a greater power, you understand exactly what I'm saying. Subdue and have dominion. That means they lock you up. Right? How many of y'all know that you have power to subdue and to walk in dominion? That's to walk in authority, to walk in and over. And this is where God created man, and then man fell. Jesus' work was to restore the work of God and to bring man back into not only just into fellowship, but into the authority of the believer through covenant. Everybody say covenant. Okay. Now in that context, as we go through this, I want to ask you this question. On a scale of 0 to 100, using the metric that... We read here in the Word of God in uh, Matthew chapter 13. You can go to Matthew 13, 23 if you would, Miss Cindy. Matthew 13, 23. From 0 to 100, how would... And this is, this, this is a introspection. We're looking inside. How would you rate your fruitfulness? How would you rate your fruitfulness in your Christian walk and in your Christian life? And this is not a, a, a thing about condemning. Some of you... Uh, if, if you're familiar with the bell curve, it looks like, it looks like a big bell. Some of you are what we, would, what we would call on the ascending side. Some of you are growing in your faith. You're doing amazing, and your life is tremendously fr uh, fruitful. I mean, just doing incredibly well. And, and so good seed into good soil in the right season always produces a wonderful, fruitful harvest. What degree? 
zero to 100, rate yourself. Don't share it with anyone else. This is between you and God. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold maturity. But he that received the seed into the good ground is he that hears the Word. And he understands it. Now, I've always been puzzled by how could good seed in good soil in the right season create a diminished return? It, it, it just seems to me like it should be a hundredfold return every time. I, and that may just be me, but just kind of wrestling with this thing all these, these years, and, and uh, I've kind of come, I, I can't say that I know for sure that this is what it is, but this is my hypothesis. This is my theory on this. This is what I think on this, at least at this point, and, and I'm not telling you that you need to adopt it, but thank you for listening at least. I, I think that I have hearing problems sometimes. Marsha will tell you in the affirmative, I really do. One of my favorite words is, huh? <laughs> I've run machinery and chainsaws for the bigger part of my life, and literally in the natural, my hearing's diminished. And she is gracious and kind, and she repeats herself and repeats herself. If I have a lot of background noise, I literally can't distinguish sometimes those sounds, and, it, and, and, and it's kind of a, a, a struggle. And she is kind and gracious, and she's good, and she's patient. I don't know. I'll ask her once in a while, what'd they say? And I'm not sure if she tells me the right thing every time. I'm not sure she don't use that to her good. But I can also tell you this, being a man, we have a man thing called selective hearing. And so I have figured out how to use that same thing. She knows it's a real thing, and so when I say, huh, it's sometimes not because I didn't hear, it's because I didn't want to hear. Yeah. Anybody here besides me got a hearing problem? Yeah, you do. Selective hearing, the man thing. I think that we have on... We have diminished return on the quality of the soil and the seed because we don't always hear what God has to say to us. I mean, I believe God's still speaking. Man don't live by what? Bread alone, but by every word. And sometimes I think that our fruitfulness is diminished because we miss an opportunity that God gave us. We miss that specific spot. And we could have seen fruitfulness if we'd have been right there, right on time, right on the spot. But I didn't get there in time. Or, and then I find that a thing, the next thing he says here is, is they hear the word and they understand it. And, and you know what I understand about God? I understand that I don't understand everything about God. Anybody say amen? Worth sharing again, especially in the context today. My dad, a pastor, sowing into this preacher kid, spoke these words. Tailgate wisdom, okay? Tailgate wisdom for, for, for a, a God-loving, God-fearing uh, pastor slash logger. Got some real basic understanding and some real wisdom. And he says these words. He's encouraging his son in the ministry. And he said, son, see, I, we, we've started. We're young in the ministry. How many of y'all know you've got to start where you've got to start, right? You can't be what you're not. You don't know what you don't know. And so you start there. And so encouraging us in, that, in, in this early part of the ministry, he, he, he said this, and it, it's, it's profound, in, and again, just tailgate wisdom. He said, son, when I started walking with God, the knowledge that I had was just like a drop in the bucket. Just a drop in the bucket. But he said, then I walked with God and I studied and I prayed and I spent time with God and my knowledge grew. How many of y'all know knowledge is one of the areas of fruitfulness that he talks about, right? He said, you'll not be un barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Him. Pastor Scott was talking about that He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. That's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3, 4, 5. And if you look in verse 4, He talks about that you would be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Him who's called us to glory and virtue. Unfruitful in knowledge. But I find that my fruit sometimes is diminished by the amount of investment that's been made. Now, in that... 
he, he, dad went on and he said, I walked with God. I, I, I spent time with God. I, I spent time in prayer. I, I studied. I exposed myself to men who knew more than I knew, who had been through this, who had been through that. And he said, and I gained a bucket of knowledge, but it was like a barrel because God got bigger. How many of y'all know God? I, I understand that. I don't understand about everything about God. And then he said, and this was toward the end of his days, and he said, I have continued, and I have continued. And so we're climbing that bell curve, the ascending side of the bell curve. I've, I've walked with God, and I've been climbing, and I've been growing. And he said, I have gained a barrel full of knowledge, but it is in an ocean of how big my God is. I've, I've felt like for so many years that was one of the most accurate pictures that was ever, ever given to me. And so I think that on the ascending side of the bell curve, that we start down here and we don't know hardly anything about God, but as we measure and we're using this metric that He gives us, they bear fruit, they bring forth some, some bring forth a hundred. Is, is that you or is that where you're at? Or, or some bring forth 60 and some bring forth 30. I think down here where we start, and we're just born again. There's this planting thing that's going on. This old hard soil. How many of y'all ever had the Spirit of God just plow your heart up? And if the soil could talk, it would be saying, what are you doing? You're turning me over. It, when the plow goes through the soil, if the soil is a living soil, it is a violent experience. It is hard. And the so How many of y'all ever had your life just turned upside down with something? Amen. And you think, it's, it's soil preparation. Soil preparation. It's so that the seed can go in. When the soil's turned upside down in this old country right here, rocks get exposed, don't they? And if you're going to be a good gardener, you have to take those rocks out so that the seed can get deep root so it can survive the hot suns of July and August, right? How many of y'all like fruitful gardens? <laughs> I think when God looks down from heaven, He sees you as that fruitful garden. He's called us to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. In this, he, he, he restates that to us through His Son, Jesus, and He teaches us that in Matthew, he, there's a metric by which we can measure. On the ascending side, as we're growing in faith, as we're hearing, how many of y'all's hearing has gotten better in hearing God as you go on? Hmm? It's not that God's speaking was ever diminished, it's just that my hearing wasn't like it should be sometimes. And I still yet deal with that once in a while, even as a more mature adult in the Christ, I still deal. And then sometimes when God begins to speak some things to me, I don't understand those. But on the ascending side, my fruitfulness is increasing. So in this measurement, are you on the ascending side, on the increasing side, where you're going from zero to 10 to 20 to 30 to 60 to 100? But then there's another side to the bell curve. And it's the descending side. It's the law of diminishing return. How many of all have ever invested something and got a return back that you wasn't too crazy about? Huh? On the descending side, I think that there are some things, some factors that come into play of how well did we pay attention to the things of God? How long did we stay with it and not give up? There are some things, and I'm not going to cover all those today. But on the descending side, if you come all the way down... Now, now, now listen to me. Here's what James, and we're going to go there just in a moment. James says these words. Faith without works is dead. Everybody say, it's dead. I have never, and I don't know if I still completely understand the term of dead faith. I think I have more. Dead faith. What, what, what does dead faith, what would be a picture? How do, how do I describe dead faith? If I have a living faith on this side and it's growing and, 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 and the fruitfulness is growing, on this side, it's descending, it's diminishing, and faith is in a dying process. Scripture teaches us this about the last days, that there's a falling away that comes. Hmm? As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39, he talks about, he says this, the writer says this, We're not of those who draw back under perdition. Perdition is when the vessel 
is tossed aside and it's thrown away because it has no value anymore. It's, it, it, it diminished. It drew back and it drew back and there was and faith with that word. So one of the terms that, uh, an, another one of those little nuggets that, that Brother Carl was talking about out there, um, he used, and, and we're using this in the terms of the church and of the mission of the church. I want to use it in terms of you, the individual who make up the church, and your mission of fruitfulness. Um, this, this term of canary in the coal mine. How many of y'all have ever heard that term, know what that means? The canary in the coal mine. Back in the day before technology and being able to measure the toxic gases that were in the different mines, they would take a canary in a small cage. And because the canary was small and, and, and little, he was more vulnerable to the toxic gases that were present. So he was the indicator. He was the first indicator that there was a problem. Now, the miners were still alive, but when the canary is no longer sitting up on the perch like this, but he's sitting up on the, right, on the back, there's a problem. It's the first indicator. Listen to, what is the canary in the coal mine concerning your faith? What's the canary in the coal mine concerning your faith? What are the indicators that our faith is not on the ascending side but is on the descending side in diminishing. Because some are, now listen to me, this is where we're going to get real with you right here. Some of you are growing by leaps and bounds, and your faith is amazing and it's just incredible. And some of you have grown, and some of you have been at the very top, and some of you have peaked. And now at this stage, now listen to me, your faith is beginning to decline. You say, well, well I'm just getting old, and that right there. Listen. If what dad taught, you'll have to make this up. I know dad's not, he's not God. But if what he taught, I've gained this barrel full of knowledge in an ocean of God. How many of y'all know there's more levels to go in God? There's a higher place to go. Look over to your name and tell them, you can go on up. huh? You can go on up. But because we follow sometimes the frailties of our flesh, the issues are going on, rather than seeing God revitalize us, we resign ourselves to saying, well, you know, I'm on the downhill slide and, and this old body. Listen, uh, the works that he's doing is not necessarily works of the flesh, but the works of the Spirit. So, just want to challenge some of that thinking process as we go through this, because here's, here's what I believe. If there was ever a time that our world needed fruitful Christianity, it is now. Anybody say amen to that one? Can you agree with me? You bet. And, and, and so, inventorying your own life. There's no condemnation on this. It's just, listen, if you're on the ascending side, I want to tell you, go get them, tiger. Get them. Get them. Get them. Huh? And if you're on the descending side, I'm going to say, hey, whoa, we need to figure out how, what's going on and what's causing the slide because you don't want to wind up down here with dead faith. Everybody say dead faith. That's, that's a tough place to be. See, that's a, what, what happens in the place of dead faith? When something's dead, it either is dying and gone or there's need of a resurrection. And we'll talk about that some probably next week. I'm not going to get there today. Um, Matthew thirteen twenty three. He talks about those that are bringing forth fruit. John fifteen sixteen. And this is the, this is the heart of the message today. I, I need you to see this, and then we'll close in James. John fifteen and sixteen. <laughs> Jesus says these words. This is red letter. You have not chosen me but I've chosen you. What? I thought I chose you. I, I, I thought I accepted you. See, it, it, but it was He that received the Word. To receive the Word means somebody had to have sent it. He was the prelude. He was before. Faith, the faith of God, the love of God reached out to me and my receiving Him was in reaction, in response to His first move. 
He chose, now listen, and he chose you. Everybody look over at your neighbor and tell them, you're chosen. No, you're chosen. Uh, when Marsh and I came in on Thursday, we drove straight from the airport in Springfield and drove here, and Kenny uh, Lowe's visitation was Thursday evening. I watched Kenny grow up his whole life. He's a 38-year-old young man, went to school with, with, with our son and uh, some of the rest of you. And uh, boy, Kenny was, he was, he, he was a Howe County boy. I'm telling you what, he was one of those. He was just as honored as they come. And, and we, we talked about this at the, at the funeral, uh, uh, about his dad, Jack. I buried Jack in 1986, his daddy. And um, so Kenny... Tenny didn't have the easiest of, of childhoods to grow up in, well, grow up without it. How many of y'all know God's plan for mom and dad are really a good plan? Is that's the way he designed it? And so don't want to really mess with the design on all that. And, and so he goes through some things. And, and But boy, Kenny had a good heart. I loved that kid. He was, he was ambitious and he good-hearted and all that. And a lot of fun to be around. And just as honor as he could come. Um, all boy. Kenny struggled with the question of why, and those that were at the funeral, I, I, I shared about that. It wasn't why God me or why God this, it was why would you even want me, God? Why would you choose me? I've done this and done this and not done this and not done that. And I've got, how, how many all have failed and fallen short? Anybody fit into that category? Huh? All have sinned, all have failed, all have fallen short. That Romans 3.23, right? Okay. And, and so I talked about this, and I, I preached a message um, that we can all identify. How many of y'all have gone to the grocery store, and you go by that grocery bin, you go by that grocery cart, and it's got a big neon sign of some kind on it, and it says, reduced for quick sale, and it's got a can on it that says, nothing. It's no label, and it's dented up, and it's bent. How many of y'all have ever felt like that can? I went down to the church pantry, God forgive me, and got a can out of it this morning, and I beat the fire out of it. <laughs> Just so I could illustrate this message today. How many of y'all ever felt like that? That the world stripped you from your labels. I have no identity. And I belong in this group. Why would God choose me? Everybody look over at your neighbor and say, He chose you. Huh? Now you can look at him and say, but I don't know why either, right? Okay, no, don't do that. Don't do that. All right. Be good. Be kind. The labels tore off. Sometimes the world gives you labels you don't even deserve, right? They're going to call you whatever they want to call you. And, and, and this one here, even under the best of circumstances, I think I feel like this, this one right here, I feel like this guy, I, I know what I am, but I'm still a little mixed vegetable once in a while, right? Anybody ever, huh? I'm a little of this and I'm a little of that and I'm a little of something else and sometimes I don't know for sure what else is in there, right? Anybody say man? All right. Let me tell you something. You see, the world would tell us that this has more value because we know what it is. But that's not true with God because God can see. He don't need a label to know what's inside. Ain't that true? So just so you know, this can come out of the same case as this can and it has the exact same value. Does anybody have a collection of cans? You've been cooking for the last 40 years and you saved every can you ever emptied. <laughs> what do you do with them? You don't have a collection of cans. You throw them in the trash. If you're a really good person, you recycle. <laughs> right? All right. Going all green this morning. Okay. Why would God choose me? Because He knows what's on the inside. He knows the value and He loves you. Look over at your name and tell him, He chose me. He chose me. He knew what He was getting, and He chose me anyway. He wanted me. And sometimes I don't know why, but He did. Anybody say amen? amen. You haven't lost your value because you've gone through some hard knocks. You haven't lost your value because the world looks down on you or put you in the reduced bin. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. 
Amen. I'll put these up here where maybe we can see them. The next one, he says, he ordained you. Ordination. I've been ordained. You know what ordination really means? What it really is, the ordination says there's a, there's a, there's a, a person of higher authority that looks at and recognizes the call of God on your life and they endorse that. You know where the, the call come from? The call of God on your life. They didn't ordain me that I could go to give me their permission. I already had permission from God. Look over at your name and tell them, you have permission to go. You have per- the call to go. The great commission is going to all the world. These signs will follow them that believe. Didn't say these signs follow the preacher, the pastor, the evangelist, the prophet, right? These signs will follow. You have been ordained. You've been chosen. You've been ordained. Let me give you the Greek definition of this word ordained real quick. Listen to these words right here. To be ordained means to be called and set forth in a specific place. Called and set forth. DL, you're called and set forth. The men that ordained me laid their hands on me, prayed for me, and said, We recognize the call and the ordination to, off, to, to operate in this office. We're setting you in the office of pastor, and we ordain that. They are recognizing what God already done. I want you to know that as your pastor, I'm recognizing what God has already done in your life. You've been chosen. You've been ordained. Who am I to reject you, huh? You go and get her done. Woo! Feeling like Larry the Cable Guy might get saved today. Get her done. All right? All right. All right, whoever's playing in second service, Aaron, or whoever you guys come on up, I'm going to wind this one down. We'll pick up there next week. That you should go forth, right? I've chosen you. I've ordained you that you should go forth. I've called you. I've set you forth in a place. Now listen. I have appointed you and established you according to God's purpose. We recognize that and we are appointing and establishing according to that. Now listen to this. By the authority of God and you are with the authority of God by and with. The authority of God put me in this place. I didn't ask for it, but it was the authority of God. Man recognized it. And not only have I been put into this position, how many all know God empowers you to carry out the mission? He empowers you to be fruitful. He's put you in a place He's called you to be fruitful and He's put you in a place, good seed, good soil, in the right season and you can bear fruit you can live a fruitful life and when you come to the end of the days goodness and mercy have been following you all along and you're headed to the house of the Lord forever how many of y'all know that's a good way to live it it's a good way to finish it which side of the bell curve are you on he goes on and I love this part right here that you should go and bring forth fruit can you see it from Genesis 1 plan of God all the way into the New Testament Matthew now we're into John And we can carry it on through. We'll get to James. Just in a second, closing James. He said, and that your fruit should remain. Everybody say remain. Remain. Replenish. Doing it again. I heard this about an apple. Rob, you'll enjoy this one. Uh, A guy was talking about, you can take an apple, a fruit, and you can count the seeds in the apple. But Now listen. He said, but you can never, ever count the apples that is in a seed. Isn't that a good piece of wisdom? Just a good little piece of wisdom. You can't because that seed gets planted and it grows up and becomes this huge apple tree and it puts off hundreds and hundreds of apples with thousands and thousands of seeds and they get planted and before it it becomes an innumerable, right, amount. You can count the seeds in that apple, but you can't count the apples in that seed. Fruitful. Being fruitful. That your fruit should remain. That apple tree, that seed, continuing to replenish and to replenish. My dad's been gone a long time, but some of the fruit of his work still remains. Amen. What are you handing off? Are you giving up? Are you on the downward slide? Or are you still climbing? Because even when you hit to that hundredfold, I think there's other levels beyond that that you can be a hundredfold at that level and another hundredfold at that level. A barrel of knowledge, a barrel of wisdom and understanding in an ocean. The hugeness of God. Let your fruit should remain. Listen to this, and whatsoever you shall ask. 
Where, where does that stop? Does that stop at the top? Or is, or is what I thought the top not really the top? It's just... Some of these mountains we've climbed... You go up and you think, I I see the top. And when you get up there and you break up, you find out that you're just on another bench up here and there's another climb still up. How many of y'all think there's more to come? I do too. In James, he says these words right here. James chapter 1, and this is where we'll start next week. In James chapter 1, he talks about, in verse 1, James, the servant of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, different temptations. Don't you know that that troubles the darkness when you do that? When you can be thankful in an unthankful world like we was talking about last week? When you can count it joy and you're going through temptation? A lot of Christians don't know how to discern the difference in a trial from God and a temptation from hell. There is a difference. The trial from God is designed, listen to me, to, it's designed to reveal the depth of your faith and your dependence on God. When we go through tests, we pay our teachers to test our students. Not to fail them, but to reveal to them the level and the degree that they have learned to. And they should be at this level so that they can move on to this level. And so tests reveal where our faith is. The canary in the coal mine, listen to me, when our vision, our outlook begins to diminish. Here's what your scripture says. Here's what your Bible says. Where there is no vision the people perish. The canary in the coal mine, the first indicator that there's a problem. Listen, the Christian's still breathing. They're going to heaven. They're still alive. Faith isn't dead, but their vision has begun to diminish. They're not dreaming the new dream. They're not thinking about, how can I go to the next level with God? How can I go? I've arrived. Would never say that, but the action speaks to that. I've arrived. When the vision begins to diminish, then faith, it's a reflection of the faith that's on the inside. And works always follows faith. Faith always, listen to me, faith always precedes work. We'll talk about that some next week. Faith and works going together. Count it all joy when you fall into these temptations. The temptation from hell is designed to take you away from God. The test from God is to reveal to you the level of your faith and take you to a higher level. Okay, there's the difference. That's the, in, in the most simplest forms. That's the difference in the test and the temptation. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Your faith will get tried. That patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. That, that word perfect means to be complete or fully mature. In James chapter 2, verse 14, and this is where I want to leave you. What does it profit, my brethren? James 2, 14. What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? There's been an argument theologically for a lot of years between those, uh, and, and there's no difference in, in, in Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, the Apostle Paul is teaching, For by grace we're saved through faith, that not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? That's what he says, right? That's, that's Ephesians 2.8. Here he says, he asks a question, though a man say he has faith, not works, can faith save him? Listen, your works are a rev- the, your outward works are a revelation of your inward faith. Faith always proceeds, and so you are saved. Works in and of itself do not save you, but works are the reflection. It's the shadow of your faith. We'll talk more about that. Bring you down to this place where we want to close. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked, destitute of daily food, one of you say, depart in peace, be warm, filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful, those things that are needful to the body, what does it profit? Good works. Everybody say fruit, right? Good work, fruit. Fruit is a massive encompassing umbrella whenever you talk about these fruits of works, these fruit of the Spirit. The, the, 
the fruits of knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of fruit that the Scripture talks about. Listen to this. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Man may say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. I'll show you my faith. Works are the revelation of an inner faith. Verse 19, last verse. You believe that there's one God. How many of y'all believe that? One God. I believe in one God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, triune Godhead in one. I didn't say I understood it. I said I believe it. How many of y'all know you can believe things you don't totally understand? Huh? Okay. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Here's the biblical definition of dead faith. You believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe. Everybody, everybody say the devils believe. That's what the Word says. They have faith. But listen to me. They don't have works. All they do is sit and tremble. They believe... But faith is dead because it never moves them into action to live out their faith. And if you never move into action to live out your faith, you never bear the fruit of faith. So the power of faith in my life, the power of faith in your life, moves us forward into action. Dead faith, listen to me, is demonic. That's the first picture he gives us. That's the example of dead faith. We're going to build on that next week. So here's what I want to challenge you with. Two things that are really on my heart for this service this morning. Number one is that metric that Jesus gave us. Are you on the ascending side at 30, 60, or 100? Or are you on the descending side of 100, 60, 30, to dead faith. The laws of diminishing return. I've invested good seed into good soil in the right season, and I'm very disappointed with the yield. You say, well, I, I don't know that that would be God. Anybody remember the parable of the, of, of the good stewards? I gave one one talent, I gave another one two talents, I gave another one five talents. Well done, good and faithful. You had two, you made two more. Well done, good and faithful. You had five, made five more. I'm going to give you the one because the one didn't take care of his business. You depart from me. I never knew you. There is a law of diminishing return. He drew back and hid. Don't hide your potential. Expose it to God and say, God, I want to be all that you've called me to be. You chose me and sometimes I don't really understand why. I, I, I wouldn't choose me. That's the second thing. One is to evaluate your life where you're at on that scale of fruitfulness. The other one, I really sense in my heart that some of you just don't feel like God could ever... Why would God want me? Because He knows the value of what's on the inside. He's not worried about your old dented can because it's going to go back to dust anyway. Amen? From dust you came into dust you return. Let's pray. Stand with me. Father God, we love you. We love you, Lord. With everything that's in us, You loved us first. You reached out to us first. You chose us. And we responded to that and we received. Thank You, Lord God, for choosing us. Thank You for choosing us. Mm. Thank You for loving us. My goodness, God, I've made so many mistakes. I felt like the labels were torn away. This old can dented up, beat up with the things that come along in life. But yet, Lord God, you see beyond the can and you can see what's in the heart and what's in the soul. You didn't save us, Lord Jesus, for this old dust-framed body. It returns to dust. You saved us for the soul and for the spirit. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for ordaining us, setting us in a place, in an area of responsibility that you would say, now you go bear fruit right here. 
You chose us for this time. You chose us for this generation. And you do not make mistakes. You chose each one in here. Now what we do with that is our return unto you. So you evaluate yourself right here, please. God, look in my heart. Am I being fruitful? Am I bearing forth the love, the patience, the goodness, the kindness? Do I bear the image of you, O God? Am I bearing the image that was set forth in Genesis? That was rebirthed in Jesus? Am I bearing forth that image? Can the world see the fruit of Christ, the fruit of your Spirit in my life? Or do they see something else? And for those that may be struggling today, why why would God want me? Marsh and I went and we had prayer with Kenny on July, on Sunday night, July the 24th. At 8.40 p.m. in the evening, we went through this whole discussion and his sister Carrie had planted some really good things and there was a a, a reading that she had read to him about all the people in the Scripture that made mistakes. But God still chose them. God still used them and they bore fruit. And I'm not sure if Kenny was saved or not at that point. He may very well have been. I know he prayed with a bunch of different folks. But I know for sure that on that night at 840, we went through Romans 10, verses 8, 9, and 10. If you believe in the heart, you confess with the mouth. With the mouth, confession is made. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And he made that confession of faith. And whether it was just written then or reaffirmed then, I am confident His name was written down. And fruit was born. And telling Kenny's story today, his sister Carrie said, when you tell this story, tell Kenny's story. So this fruit to Kenny, to a life that was too short, on this earth but on the other side eternal God loved Kenny God chose Kenny dance labels and all anybody here says listen I don't know why God would want me heads bowed eyes closed anybody here just and I'm not going to call your name I just want to pray for you anybody say I don't know why God would choose me I made so many mistakes yeah one anybody else anybody else another one yeah another one yeah it's all good another one see several anybody else yeah you can put them down there's another one yeah it's all good God God knows what he's doing God knows what he's doing he chose you and he does not make mistakes he was so intentional just like with Jeremiah he said before I formed you in your mother's womb I knew you and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations Woo. That's an all-powerful, mighty God that can do that. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. You're not inferior. You're chosen and ordained. God loves you. And He sees great value in you. Don't let the devil rob you of your fruitfulness. Father God, we pray over each one. We speak words of truth We speak words of affirmation, chosen, loved. You spoke, Father God, words of affirmation over your son Jesus when you said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And you affirmed him and the fruit and the walk that he was on. And you gave him. So we speak that affirmation to your children. And those that are on the ascending side, we encourage and we say, Go on and you keep growing and you keep, you keep moving forward. You keep stretching and you keep growing. And for those that may have crested and are on the descending side, we say, you need to put this thing in woe. You need to put this thing in reverse. You need to turn around because the bottom of this 
is a demonic dead faith. I believe, but I'm doing nothing with it. If you're on that side, Father God, we say forgive us. We repent. Turning around, Lord God. Oh God, don't let us embrace and engage a dead faith because it has a diminished vision and declining works. May we continue to work. May we continue to be fruitful. Replenishing, replenishing, and replenishing that that fruit would remain until you return. We speak and we declare these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody that agreed said amen. Look over at your neighbor and tell them, now I know why he chose you. Huh? Now I know why he chose you. You're something. You're special. God loves you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for those that are tuned in watching live. We love you as well. Come be with us anytime you can. You are dismissed in the name of Jesus. We love you. Go in the grace and the peace of God.